Welcome, Age of Vintage Society. Teresa Wright lived a rich, complex, magnificent life against the backdrop of Golden Age Hollywood, Broadway and television. There was no indication from her astonishingly difficult, indeed horrifying, childhood of the success that would follow, nor of the universal acclaim and admiration that accompanied her everywhere. How Teresa Wright fiercely fought not to be a glamour girl. Make sure to watch the video until the end and leave your thoughts in the comments. If you are new here, join our wonderful community by subscribing to the Age of Vintage channel. Movie and Broadway stars come in all sizes and shapes. A rare few excel both on screen and the live stage, all of which makes the strange case of Teresa Wright all the more baffling. A natural and lovely talent who was discovered for films by Samuel Goldwyn, the always likeable Teresa Wright distinguished herself early on in high-caliber, Oscar-worthy form, the only performer ever to be nominated for Oscars for her first three films. Always true to herself, she was able to earn Hollywood stardom on her own unglamorized terms. Few actresses have had such a meteoric start to their Hollywood careers as the fetchingly unpretentious Teresa Wright. Teresa Wright, the high-minded ingenue who marshalled intelligence and spunk to avoid being typecast as another 1940s sweater girl. Why is she so little remembered today? Her meteoric landing in Hollywood in 1941 is the stuff of legend. I never wanted to be a star, she said. I only wanted to be an actress. Born Muriel Teresa Wright in New York City in 1918, Wright spent her first years with relatives after her parents separated. When she was eight, her father sent her to Rosehaven, a private girls' school in New Jersey. After three years there, she attended public school in Maplewood. In the spring of 1939, after both the lead actress Martha Scott and her understudy Dorothy McGuire left the production, Wright played the lead through that summer. She had the opportunity to perform in the hometown of the playwright Thornton Wilder, where he coached the actors. She began acting on the stage in summer stock and repertory at the age of 18. When Thornton Wilder and Jed Harris saw her in an ingenue role, she was chosen to understudy the part of Emily in the original production of Our Town, which she then played in touring productions. Samuel Goldwyn saw her first starring role on Broadway in the historic production of Life with Father. At once he offered her a long contract. Teresa insisted on some highly unusual clauses in her contract, refusing to take part in any of the usual glamour publicity photos to which young starlets were subjected. It was a sign of the seriousness with which she viewed her acting career, and the fact that Goldwyn agreed to it shows how highly he thought of the young actress. The circumstances of her tenure at Goldwyn and the drama of her breaking that contract forever changed the treatment of stars. The 21-year-old Wright played a refreshingly pretty small-town girl of 16. Wright was seated at her dressing table when I was introduced, Goldwyn recalled, and looked for all the world like a little girl experimenting with her mother's cosmetics. I had discovered in her from the first sight, you might say, an unaffected genuineness and appeal. It said that she shall not be required to pose for photographs in a bathing suit unless she is in water, Neither may she be photographed running on the beach with her hair flying in the wind, nor may she pose in any of the following situations. In shorts, playing with a cocker spaniel, digging in a garden, whipping up a meal, attired in firecrackers, and holding sky rockets for the 4th of July, looking insinuatingly at the turkey for Thanksgiving, wearing a bunny cap with long ears for Easter, twinkling on prop snow in a skiing outfit while a fan blows her scarf. He asked her to play the role of Betty Davis's daughter in The Little Foxes in 1941. Her contract for this production is thought to be unique in movie history. Clause 39 spelled out the many poses and shots that the actress could not be required to perform. Although this was part of Wright's efforts to protect her reputation as a serious actress by avoiding cheesecake publicity photos, the stipulations aroused an array of comments from the press. Her performance in the film moved its director, William Wyler, to tell the New York Times that she was the most promising young actress he had ever directed. As Alexandra Giddens, the daughter of the vixenish Regina, Betty Davis, Wright, 
more than held her own and was nominated for an Oscar as Best Supporting Actress. She won the award the following year for Mrs. Miniver, in which she played Greer Garson's aristocratic but democratic daughter-in-law. In this wartime drama about an English family trying to maintain normal life during the Battle of Britain, Wright is killed by a bomb, though her spirit hangs over the rest of the film. She didn't consider herself a glamour girl, which could account for the sparsity of glamorous photo shoots compared to other it girls. Her small illuminating gestures, which allowed her to transcend what could have been saccharine predictable roles, her characters often displayed decency, integrity and steely resolve, traits she also possessed in real life. She refused to pose for glamour or cheesecake photos, declined roles if they conflicted with her family life, and rejected competition with other actresses, forming friendships with many of them. For all her allure as the fetching girl next door, Wright fiercely fought not to be a glamour girl. She loathed pictures in bathing suits and interviews with fan magazines, and told Goldwyn as much. He assured her he was not of the bathing suit school of Hollywood producers, and promised to promote her more ethereal talents. There would be no leg art, no whispered romances for the columnists, no orchid and ermine setting for her background, her contract stipulated. But Miss Wright's disregard for Hollywood's demands eventually caused Goldwyn to terminate her contract in 1948. In their highly publicised exchange, he said she was lax in publicising her pictures. She said movies had become too brazenly commercial. She was originally set to star in producer David O. Selznick's Duel in the Sun, which was written by her then-husband, Niven Bush. However, shortly before filming was to begin, she got pregnant, and Bush had to go to Selznick's office to inform him that she would have to bow out of the film. Selznick, known for his single-mindedness, tried to talk Bush into letting her play the part, which called for a lot of physical action, and Bush absolutely refused. As he turned to leave the office, Selznick blurted out, Damn it, Bush, she isn't the only one. An Oscar winner by the age of 24, with batting a thousand record, there was essentially nowhere to go but down. Still, before the inevitable fade of her career, she managed two more all-time classics, doing her best acting for Alfred Hitchcock in Shadow of a Doubt, and appearing the perfect ensemble of one of the very best picture winners the best years of our lives. You're just an ordinary little girl living in an ordinary little town, said Joseph Cotton's Uncle Charlie in Alfred Hitchcock's Shadow of a Doubt, his niece and namesake Charlie, played by Teresa Wright, who has died at age 86, replies, Oh, I don't know, I guess I don't like to be an average girl in an average family. Though on the surface many of the characters Wright played appeared to be just sweet and pretty girl-next-door types, their simple exteriors usually covered a tenacious temperament. Hitchcock thought Wright was one of the most intelligent actors he had worked with and brought out her vivacity and warmth, not epithets generally associated with Hitch's heroines. In Shadow of a Doubt, she exudes youthful idealism in her worship of her suave uncle, though this turns to disillusion when she discovers he is the Merry Widow murderer and defiantly threatens to expose him at the risk of her own life. She was rather more complex as Robert Mitchum's adoptive sister and wife in Pursued, Raoul Walsh's brilliant psychological western, which was written by Wright's first husband. They married in 1942 and were divorced ten years later. As she entered her thirties, Wright, always attractive but never seen as glamorous, was offered parts of rather plain women in less interesting films. With notable exceptions such as The Men, her co-star was Marlon Brando, I chose to do the men for $25,000, she once explained. Your importance was determined by how much money you made. The men was a flop, and I never again achieved the kind of status I had with my first few films. I was going to be Joan of Arc, she said in an interview with the New York Post in 1969, and all I proved was that I was an actress who would work for less money. Goldwyn released her from her contract, leading to fewer, less lucrative movie roles and a subsequent move into stage, television and radio work. Wright's screen heyday was short-lived, as many careers are when the success is so instantaneous and large. Still, it's hard to knock the girl next door beauty for not being able to live up to her first two years in Hollywood. 
Although Wright earned critical praise for her roles in two classics, later roles in Hollywood pictures did not enhance her career. Part of this may be related to Wright's consistent refusal to do publicity work for her films. Her intense desire for privacy may have prevented her from becoming a true Hollywood star by keeping her out of the public's eye. Wright retired from the screen in 1959 when she married playwright Robert Anderson. They divorced, remarried and divorced again, though they always remained friends. Teresa's life was not fertile territory for gossip columnists. She was not a party girl and she stood out as one of the few actresses who did not try to use her beauty to advance her career. Quite the contrary, from the start of her career she insisted on being judged on her acting ability alone, completely shunning the traditional glamour role. She never appeared in the role of seductress or sex kitten, but rather the traditional supportive and devoted wife or daughter. Being an uncommonly strong-minded, highly intelligent actress who refused to fit into the typical Hollywood template, more importantly Wright was exacting in her choice of projects and co-workers, often passing up on the sort of ingenue roles typically handed to attractive young actresses. Wright's initial blitz on the screen slowed considerably after disputes with the controlling Goldwyn and her strenuous avoidance of the public limelight. Her privacy demands almost certainly resulted from a heartbreaking childhood in poverty, with a street worker mother who failed to shelter her daughter from the harsh realities of that life. However, Wright chose intellectual companions. Wright's dignified and deeply human screen persona, with an emphasis on substance over glamour, allowed her to develop as something other than a commodity. For those fortunate to have seen Wright on stage, the luminous intelligence, emotional availability and dry humour on display in her best screen roles were vividly present in the live theatre. To be remembered as an uncommonly fine actress would undoubtedly have pleased Wright. She pushed the conventions of glamour clean off the stage and screen, bringing a quality of naturalness of immediacy, of, yes, honour to the human qualities she found in a role. If you liked this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up, subscribe if you are new here, and if you want to support my work, please visit my Patreon page. Now it is your turn. What do you think about the life and legacy of Teresa Wright? She had a long acting career, although she only appeared in 28 films, and all of her most successful films were at the start of her career.